Well, if I could ask everyone to take their seats, we're going to get started. Good afternoon. I hear phones ringing. I never get a phone call. <laughs> That's Murphy's Law. I think I know almost everybody, but my name is David Rubin, and I'm the current chief of our section of gastroenterology, hepatology, and nutrition here. I want to welcome everybody to a special event. I want to start by welcoming all of our former chiefs of the section who are here today being honored and who have made trips from near and far to be with us and brought their wonderful family members with them. So thank you all for being here for this. I also want to acknowledge and welcome the members of our GI Research Foundation board who have joined us. And we're delighted that you're here with us today and of course look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Our faculty from the section of GI as well as many of our trainees who are all in the back eating the free food. <laughs> I also want to acknowledge and welcome many of the support staff and our wonderful administrators. And before we get too far into today, I want to give a very special thank you to Kathy Pentazis, who was instrumental in organizing everything that we're doing today and has worked with me on this for a long time. So uh, we've been affectionately calling this Kathy's bat mitzvah. Um, <laughs> but Kathy, thank you for all of your hard work putting this together. Today is indeed a very special day. Uh, I have been asked by some why do this at all, or what is the impetus for this? And part of it was that we had renovated this nice space, of course, several years ago. But part of it also was that I've always believed in honoring our legacy and recognizing leaders who built what we now are benefiting from. And certainly the University of Chicago section of gastroenterology has a very proud and strong legacy. And I think that uh, too often as we go through our day to day, and especially these days with the challenges we all face in medicine, it becomes easy to lose track of the bigger picture. And I wanted to acknowledge those who came before us, who worked very hard, and also uh, acknowledge those who are here now, those who are working day to day, every day here, and those who are our future, who are sitting in the back of the room. Um, but also, really, this is a testament to the many thousands of patients that we've all cared for and for whom our research endeavors were pursued. Uh, I'm going to do a brief presentation uh, about the history of GI here, and then we're going to be uh, truly honored by hearing from some of our former chiefs as well as from some of their family members. And of course, what you're all waiting for is to see uh, the beautiful portraits that have been painted of these individuals. I also want to point out, especially to my faculty and fellows who didn't necessarily realize this, that we have finally hung up all the other photos of our section over the many years in the hallway out there. So you can go back and see um, all those years of photos and uh, reflect on that. So allow me to take you through uh, the history of GI at the University of Chicago in a brief few minutes um, before I hand it off to uh, Robert Palmer, who will be telling us more about his father. So actually, in the GI milestones, I have to start with when Billings Hospital opened, which was September of 1926. And the hospital was built here. You can see it's actually open here, but it's not even completely done. There's some scaffolding still up. Uh, but the hospital was built with the idea that the great University of Chicago should have a medical center, and it should be structured in a unique way. The faculty were actually hired to be full-time faculty, and the concept of an academic faculty was a relatively new idea. As many in the room may reflect or know, uh, faculty at the time were really often in private practice and would donate their time to teach or to do research on the side. But the University of Chicago was established with a different principle that everyone hired would be there to do research and to advance the field. Walter Palmer was one of the first eight faculty hired, uh, joined in 1927, and his initial research was focused on peptic ulcer disease and pain, and we're going to hear more about his wonderful history from his son in a little bit. 
And this photo, which I found in the archives, is actually of those first eight faculty. Uh, in this picture, they were celebrating the 25th anniversary of the Medical Center. Uh, they had all been still there working at that time. And you can appreciate that Walter Palmer is up here uh, where the pointer is. Um, but there's also some really quite famous and well-known faculty, in in, of course, including Charlie Huggins, who won the Nobel Prize for Medicine and Physiology for his work on hormones and cancer. In 1934, uh, Rudolf Schindler came to Chicago and was one of the first endoscopists in the world, but certainly in Chicago, and came here to establish gastroscopy and to do some of his early work. I found this great picture of him in our archives. You can see him here with what was then essentially a rigid scope. It had a flexible tip um, and some of the work that he did while he was here for uh, the short number of years that he joined faculty. And then subsequently, uh, Dr. Kirzner joined Dr. Palmer in 1936. Many in the room have heard his stories. Uh, I'm grateful that we have uh, Sonia Kupfer, one of our faculty members today, who when she was a resident here and a chief resident actually um, studied with Dr. Kirzner and told his story. So we're going to get to hear from both Dr. Kupfer and uh, actually from Dr. Kirzner himself, as you'll see from a video clip about his time here. And there he is, the young Dr. Kirzner, um, uh, sitting in his office surrounded by work, of course. And we move on. In 1948 was the development of the Division of Research Grants of the NIH. You might wonder why that's a milestone for GI. Um, some in the room recall the story that actually after World War II, when the Department of Defense grants were shifted to the newly created National Institutes of Health, it was both Dr. Kirzner and Dr. Palmer who were surprised that there weren't more physician scientists working in that newly formed NIH and challenged them and created the general medicine section within the NIH and really helped to shape that organization. And in 1956, the NIH gave uh, both Dr. Kirzner and Dr. Palmer the first training grant in GI, which was here, and they had two fellows at that time. In 1962, um, due in fact to Dr. Kirzner working quite hard and Dr. Palmer had recently retired, um, the GI Research Foundation was created by two grateful patients and friends of Dr. Kirzner. Uh, and of course, that organization now is more than 50 years old and has done a wonderful job supporting the, the section over these many years. And we often uh, think back to those early days when these individuals had the vision to work with Dr. Kirzner. In 1983, the Bernard Mitchell Hospital opened. Now, why is this a milestone in GI? Well, it was actually Dr. Kirzner's work with Bernard Mitchell that led to his $14 million gift that um, was the resultant uh, hospital named after uh, Mr. Mitchell. And there was a relationship there that preceded that, uh, as you might guess. And so we're quite proud of that. Also, we can fast forward to now when the Bernard Mitchell Hospital is undergoing a major renovation and turn, being turned into a cancer hospital. And as I went through the history of GI here, this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, but there were many different areas of focus, and they sort of um, reflect what was happening in the world of science and medicine, but the early work of peptic ulcer disease and pain, and Dr. Kirzner's PhD thesis on alkalosis, uh, an early interest in ulcerative colitis here, uh, the interest in nutrition in GI diseases and protein loss and protein metabolism, uh, lots of work on ACTH and steroids for a variety of GI diseases, additional work on IBD, which included Crohn's disease by that time, some interesting work on GI immunology and early elements of transplantation, of course, lots of uh, themes related to cancer, and more recently, celiac disease. So you can see, you can, you can actually look at the history of GI and see all these areas of focus at the University of Chicago. So moving on, in 1987, the Center for the Study of Digestive Diseases opened. This was a result of the fact that the Bernard Mitchell Hospital enabled lots of the space in the Billings Hospital to be converted to laboratories, and GERF raised $2 million to help support that. The training grant became more formalized and started in 1995 and has continued to this day uh, under the uh, leadership of Gene Chang, who uh, is still here, but sorry he couldn't make it today. In 1996, the Digestive Diseases Research Core Center started and is continuing to this day, also under Gene's leadership along with Bana Jabri. In 2009, uh, very importantly, the NAP Center for Biomedical Discovery was completed. And this was important to GI because uh, it enabled all of our labs that were here to move over to this new facility. And in fact, GI has most of the ninth floor and part of the tenth and second floors of this wonderful facility. And moving on then, of course, to the present day, the Center for Care and Discovery opened in 2013. And since it opened, actually, the third floor was finished uh, after the hospital actually opened and is now our digestive disease unit 
for all of our patients from uh, all the different subspecialties. And of course, our procedure unit is on the fifth floor. And we've been fortunate to have that. In 2013, we also created a digestive diseases center, merging some of our interests with our colleagues in pediatrics and transplant, uh, and co-directed by uh, Neil Hyman, our colorectal surgery chief, and myself, uh, which really reflected our change in some of our focus and a broader vision of what we were trying to do. So here we are to today, and I wanted to update some of our visitors so they knew where we were as a section. We've really grown. We have 36 faculty, 45% of whom are women. We have 10 professors and four endowed chairs, including our most recent endowed chair, Bana Jabri, pictured at the top here. We're now actually in six different locations around the city in Northwest Indiana. In 2017, we had over 20,000 clinic visits and over 12,000 GI procedures. We have 17 fellows, eight advanced practice providers, which are advanced practice nurses and a variety of others. And there's over 150 people in this GI section. Uh, we've really grown over all these years, and it's really remarkable to reflect on all the people who came before. We have all these different programs focusing on different areas within GI and led by our faculty and really multidisciplinary work, including our Cancer Risk and Prevention Clinic, our Center for Esophageal Diseases, our Obesity Center, which is now growing um, quite rapidly, and our Food Allergy Center, as well as, of course, our world-renowned Celiac Center and IBD Center, many others. And our research has grown. We now collaborate across multiple different areas, including working with Argonne National Labs and the Marine Biological Labs, as well as the Center for Research Informatics, and most recently some of the expansion to the Polsky Center, which is for entrepreneurship and um, intellectual property growth. So we've had a long growth as a section, and we've had some wonderful leaders, and we're really grateful that today we have family members and others who know um, our former chiefs quite well. And I'm going to hand it off now so we can hear about each of them in their brief times here before we unveil their portraits. So with this, I, I have a slide for each of our former chiefs. Um, and I'm actually going to invite uh, Robert Palmer to join us at the podium to speak about his dad, Walter Palmer. I want to also thank Robert uh, publicly because he's also served on our newly created Alumni Award Selection Committee, and he's really been quite an active alum, and we're grateful for that, and we're always delighted that you can come back to visit. So come up and tell us about Dad. Well, thank you, David, for the introduction, and thank you also for honoring the traditions of this institution. They're really wonderful. Uh, and. Um, if any of you want to follow up on some of the things that David referred to, uh, there are two really good books. Uh, you can get them at Curar, and maybe there are some in your office, David. But one is by Elsa Vieth on the early history of the, uh, of the University of Chicago Medical School. And the other is the uh, book by uh, Dr. Vermeulen, uh, The Greatest Good for the Greatest, uh, I forgot what the exact title is. It's in the references here at the back of this. Uh, uh, these notes. And they, they contain a lot of interesting information about how the medical school came about. It really is a very complicated story with the interrelationship of various institutions in Chicago and the university and Rockefeller and so forth. And I want to also at this time thank Kathy. Again, Kathy was most helpful. And where is Kathy? Well, anyway, there you are. There you are. <laughs> Tremendously helpful in helping me getting those books out of the out of the career, I had given away all of my copies of the books before I came here. So I had to get them out again and find some of the early stuff. So as uh, David said, uh, Walter Lincoln Palmer was born June 29th, 1980, 1896. Am I doing anything wrong here? <coughs> okay. In Evanston, Illinois, the son of Walter Aaron Palmer, who practiced medicine there, and Alice Bonney. The first Walter Palmer in the United States was one of the founders of Stonington, Connecticut, where the family lived for several generations. Walter's great-great-grandfather, Isaac, of Plainfield, Connecticut, was a third son and therefore received no inheritance. So he became a doctor in the late 1700s and went west into the Western Reserve. His wife was said to have been the first white woman and their son, Isaac, the first child born in, in the Western Reserve, which was uh, later to become Ohio for Dr. Wyant's history of Ohio. I still have the mortar and pestle that he used made of melted coins. The family who were farmers and then potters moved from Ohio to Illinois. Walter's, Walter's father, who had graduated from Rush Medical School, 
found practice in Evanston challenging without, having, without owning a horse and carriage. So the family moved recently, briefly to Minnesota and then to Colorado where Walter grew up. Walter entered Colorado College in 1914, but after three years with the draft threatening, he decided to go to medical school. He was accepted at Harvard, Columbia, and Rush, but chose Rush because it was closer to home. At that time, the first year of Rush was conducted at the University of Chicago, where Walter did extra work in physiology with Dr. A.J. Carlson. To qualify for a BA based on his first year in medical school, Walter had to pass several examinations and take a course in organic chemistry. He went to Professor Stieglitz to be exempted, saying, I haven't any patience with the requirement that I repeat work I've already had, referring to his work at Colorado College under uh, uh, a noted professor there. Professor Stieglitz responded, Mr. Palmer, it's your patience we are thinking of. So Walter took the examinations and received his BS in 1918. He got his MS at the suggestion of Andrew Ivey, and this was based on Walter's completion of Ivey's original research project, and that came in 1919, and he got his PhD in 1926 for his work on peptic ulcer. Walter was at Rush in 1918 when the war broke out, and he joined the Medical Enlisted Reserve Corps billeted in Hitchcock Hall. As he neared graduation in 21, he went to see a Dr. B.W. Sippy about an internship at Presbyterian Hospital. Sippy asked him if he was going to write the county. When Walter said yes, Sippy beamed and replied, 18 months at the county is worth $15,000 to any man. He also said that if Walter failed the county, he could come with him, or if he made the county, he could come to him after. Walter wrote, as they called in those days, 12th place and started his internship in the county in July of 21. Internship in those days consisted of six months of junior services, medical and surgical, second six months, the Midler's service, three months on tuberculosis, and the th three months in the admitting office, which Walter thought was particularly valuable. The final six months were three in the senior medical and three in the senior surgical services. In December of 1922, Walter moved to the Presbyterian Hospital to start a year on the Sippy service. About two, about two months later, he was called to pump the stomach of a patient of Dr. Brown, a young woman named Elizabeth Ricketts, and to take her blood counts. He spent several evenings making her acquaintance. After about a week, Dr. Brown indicated she was about uh, he was about to send her home. Uh, as this meant that she would be leaving for California with her mother, Walter suggested that perhaps she was not right, quite ready for discharge. <laughs> Dr. Brown caught on immediately and said, no, she'll have to stay another week. <laughs> when Walter eventually married Miss Ricketts, her mother threatened to send Walter the bill. In 1925, Walter began his residency at the county, perhaps the third resident there, while simultaneously holding a fellowship in physiology at the University of Chicago. During that time, he conducted his work on the mechanism of pain in peptic ulcer and developed the Palmer acid test, work for which he was awarded his PhD. The next year, he became engaged to and then married Elizabeth Ricketts. They received a wedding present from her mother of a trip to Europe, which was delayed when Walter's father developed pernicious anemia. Interestingly, he was cured thanks to Dr. Mino when he started to eat raw liver, his blood counts increasing rapidly from one and a half million to four and a half million. With his father's health assured, Walter and Elizabeth left for Europe in September of 26. During the year in Europe, Walter spent about six months in Vienna taking medical courses and then went to Berlin to visit a certain Dr. Stark who did endoscopies, gastroscopies. Dr. Stark agreed to give him four lessons for $50. The first two lessons consisted of passing the Ewald tube, with which, of course, Walter was already very familiar. When Walter demanded to see a gastroscopy before paying any more money, the doctor became furious and started to chase him around the world, around the room. And Walter had to beat a retreat, literally to avoid a physical confrontation. It turned out that the doctor had left a string of perforated esophagi and stomachs around the continent. After that, Walter went to Berlin, where he was able to watch Schindler perform gastroscopies with his rigid instrument at that time. 
While in Vienna, Walter received a letter from Dr. Franklin McLean offering him a position as assistant professor of medicine at the new University of Chicago Medical School, which opened October 1st, uh, 1927, a year after the hospital was finished. Uh, that was just 90 years ago last fall. Uh, he uh, was offered a salary of $4,500 a year, and he accepted. When the medical school opened, uh, as David pointed out, there were seven members of the Department of Medicine under the chairman, Dr. McLean. Mr. Dr. Emmett Bay, a cardiologist and the first person to practice at Billings Hospital. Dr. Samuel Becker, a dermatologist. Dr. Robert Block, a pulmonologist. Dr. Louis Leiter, who was interested in renal disease. And Dr. C. Philip Miller, an expert in, in infectious diseases. Dr. Oswald Robertson, a hematologist plus Dr. Paul Hodges, a radiologist who was a member of the Department of Medicine until the Department of Radiology was established when? In 1953. At that time, there were no subspecialty departments. There were subspecialty medical services and clinics based on the members' individual interests. But due to the general feeling that physicians were internists first, the medical services were all given numbers rather than names. The first <coughs> The eight services I recall, possibly based on seniority of the original faculty members, were one, cardiology, two, infectious diseases, three, hematology, four, renal, five, diabetes and metabolism, later expanded to be 5A, uh, endocrinology, 5B, uh, metabolism, and 5C, rheumatology, and then six was GI, seven, chest, I think, and eight, neurology. So while they did have a GI clinic and a GI service, they did not have a GI department. Walter made quite a, a point out of the fact that he was always professor of medicine and never professor of gastroenterology. During his long service with the American Board of Internal Medicine, he and others, including Harry Bacchus and Chester Jones of the MGH, were adamant that gastroenterology should be a subspecialty rather than its own specialty. The formal name of the GI section originated with Dr. Kirshner. Back at the USC, the internal medicine orientation was manifested by the fact that admissions to the medical services were assigned by lay people in the admissions office rather than by physicians and often on rather loose criteria. Therefore, patients with substernal pain of cardiac origin might end up on the GI service and patients with reflux esophagitis might end up on the cardiac service, thus reflecting the differential diagnosis of any given condition. It wasn't until the late 50s or 60s that a general medicine service was established, essentially confirming the growing importance and autonomy of the specialty services. For at least several decades, the major conferences of the Department of Medicine were the grand rounds held on P7, in P117. These were regularly attended by all the professors, and the cross-examinations by the senior physicians, while always respectful, could get quite pointed and contentious. Many of these were dramatic and marvelous teaching ex exercises. As a sidebar, I have to mention that I will never forget one grand rounds conducted by Milton Friedman, who argued forcefully that doctors should not be licensed. The marketplace would weed out the incompetence. <laughs> Walder's interest in gastroenterology probably stemmed from several sources. The first and probably main source of Walder's interest were his own gastrointestinal problems. He had received an appendectomy for chronic appendicitis while he was at Colorado College, but his trouble continued. Much later, he heard Sippy give a superb lecture on irritable bowel syndrome, and he realized that was his problem. Sippy was a master at treating this condition, and from Sippy evolved the regimen of a low residue, non-laxative diet with phenobarbital and belladonna. It sur survived as the standard of treatment at least until the 70s. Interestingly, just the opposite is now recommended, the high fiber diet, indicating that diet may not be as important as the skill of the therapist. Well, partly. Having been trained to use this regimen by JBK, I confidently prescribed it to the first patient I ever saw with IBS at Columbia. No response whatsoever. I then realized that what the patient had not received from me was the GI workup in hospital, the whole ball of wax, you know what that is, accompanied by, uh, followed by a summary conference at the patient's bedside, accompanied by the whole panoply of residents, intern, medical students, nurses, nutritionists, and possibly an awestruck visiting physician. No wonder it didn't work. 
The second source of Walder's interest in GI was his early work with Sippy and his own research on the mechanism of pain of peptic ulcer. Because of this interest and the good result of the Sippy regimen of milk and powders, some people may remember that was four grams of calcium carbonate and four grams of magnesium carbonate as appropriate, alternating every hour. The beds were filled with ulcer patients. At that time, most of the medical beds were in the ward at the end of M4, which is where David's office is right now and some of this other area right here were, were the uh, original ward of the uh, GI service. There are a few private beds along M4 corridor here, uh, but uh, mainly the, SI, uh, uh, the VIPs were hospitalized on S3, and that was a, a sacrosanct uh, area. Some of you may remember that. I can remember screening those patients on the ward for the telltale deposits of calcium in, <coughs> um, in the iris that warned the milk alkali syndrome at a time when blood calcium measurements were not so readily available. Dr. Kirshner, as David mentioned, did his, some of his early work on the mechanism of the milk alkali syndrome. Walder's interest was heightened by the technological advances in radiology and endo endoscopy. Walder had been interested in gastrointestinal radiology from its early days, particularly the work of Professor Berg, whom he'd met in Hamburg. At the UC, radiology was under the direction of Paul Hodges, and at this time that was mainly fluoroscopy. In the late 30s, under Fred Templeton, they advanced to x-rays taken with aimed exposure at the duodenum or, the, or their stomach. An offshoot of this was Walder's later interest, around 37 as I, as I recall, in the possibility of using radiation therapy for treating peptic ulcers. It worked, but obviously had disadvantages. In endoscopy, Rudolf Schindler had gone on to develop the semi-flexible gastroscope. Although it only had a flexible tip, it permitted a much greater visualization of the stomach. Now Schindler in Germany had been sent to, uh, as a Jew to a concentration camp, but he was somehow gotten out by his wife, who was a Gentile. He needed to leave Germany, and Walter arranged for him to come to, the, to Chicago. Here he had remarkable results doing gastroscopies, with his wife, a nurse, holding the patient's head as he passed the scope. It turned out that the major function of Mrs. Schindler was to keep the volatile, <laughs> volatile Schindler calm. Schindler uh, later left the University of Chicago during the war because of a disagreement about the significance of gastritis. He thought gastritis should be considered a service-connected disability, whereas Walter said that if you discharged all the soldiers with gastritis, you'd be retiring half of the army. This eventually led to Schindler moving to Michael Reese and then eventually to California. Third, because of the overlap in symptoms between irritable bowel syndrome and inflammatory bowel disease, they began to see more and more inflammatory bowel disease. <clears throat> then in the 40s, the advent of steroids and ACTH, the first really effective treatments for IBD, revolutionized the therapeutic possibilities. They initially experimented with huge doses of these drugs, and Walter always felt that there were some patients who failed to respond to steroids but did respond to ACTH. Fortunately, more effective and efficacious therapies are now available. Fourth, Walter, along with many others, became interested in the role of psychosomatic factors in GI disease. While never completely accepting psychoanalysis, he daily saw the effects of emotions on disease and came to believe that, a psycholog that psychological factors were critical in treating patients with a panoply of GI disorders. He frequently told the story of how, when he was a resident at Cook County and doing physiological research at Chicago, he had inserted a balloon into the stomach of an Irish policeman and was recording the stomach contraction on a chymograph. When the session ended about four hours later, the patient pulled a $5 bill out of his wallet, presented it to Walder with gratitude, saying, that was the best treatment I ever had. <laughs> Walter had a happy life at the University of Chicago. He lived on 58th Street, right across from Scammons Gardens at the lab school. He and his wife raised four children, three of whom became physicians. Henry and I here represent those today. He would walk to work along 58th Street and across the quadrangles. At that time, Billings had a parking lot right behind the M corridor where I would occasionally pick him up after work in later years. Walter's office was on the fourth floor at the junction of the M and P corridors 
I think uh, what's there right now? You see, there's some lab there you have there, it, it, the, where the now the corridor continues on, uh, went right through where his office was, I think. And he shared uh, that uh, area of two rooms in a secretary with Robert Block, the chess physician. The main library, Billings Library, was on P2. Clinic was on M2 and operated six mornings a week. Uh, and attending rounds were also conducted six days a week. It was a small medical community and everyone knew everyone else. They would share cars and drive to Atlantic City for the spring meetings. Not infrequently, various faculty members would meet at the Quadrangle Club for lunch. Later, the cafeteria was constructed in the basement of Billings. While Walter never became involved administratively in the Department of Medicine at Chicago, he was very active in professional organizations. He was a longtime member of the AGA, becoming president in 46. He was chairman of the editorial board of gastroenterology from 51 to 57, he received the Julius Friedenwald Award in 78, he served on the Board of Internal Medicine from 47 to 55 and was chairman from 51 to 55. He was very interested in and involved in the American College of Physicians and gave the presidential address in 1957 on the topic of the world po population crisis. He served as the president of the Southeast Chicago Commission in 1967. Other organizations to which he belonged included the American Clinical and Climatological Association, the AMA, the ASCI, the AAP, and the Central Society for Clinical Research. Other awards included the Alfred Stengel Award of the American College of Physicians, the John Phillips Award, an honorary degree, Doctor of Science degree from Colorado College, and various honorary society memberships. When Walter retired at the mandatory age of 65, he set up office in Woodlawn Hospital and <clears throat> continued to see patients there for over 25 years. Walter was perhaps happiest when he was taking care of patients, and in this he had a remarkable facility and understanding. In 1961, the section was handed over to Joe Kershner, who greatly expanded the GI section and made it what it was, what it is today. Walter died peacefully in Chicago on October 28, 1993, at the age of 96, following a fall in his home. Thank you for the opportunity of being here and sharing some of his life with you for those who uh, never knew him and uh, reminding people who did of uh, what he did. Thank you. Thanks, Bob. It's now my pleasure to invite Sonia Kupfer to the podium. Uh, Sonia is one of our faculty currently uh, and also the director of our GI Cancer Risk and Prevention Clinic. She also is the Associate Section Chief for Education and has done some remarkable work here. As I previously mentioned, when she was Chief Resident here, she uh, chose as one of her projects to interview Dr. Kersner and then to prevent, present part of the story of his life and the doctor-patient relationship uh, at Grand Rounds. So she's a perfect person to tell us a little bit more about Dr. Kersner's time here. Sonia? Thanks so much, David. It really is an honor, and I feel like it's nearly an impossible task to really have 10 minutes to talk about Dr. Kersner, and really it will just be scratching the surface. And I know that many of you knew him much longer than I did, and some of you have never met Dr. Kersner. So as David said, I had the opportunity to spend about twice a month with him over the time of my chief residency, and it was really Tuesdays with JBK, and we talked about his his life. And so through that, I learned about his early days at the um, University of Chicago and some of the trials and tribulations that he um, had to go through in his academic career and starting off. Um, of course, as many of you know, he spent um, time in the war actually on two fronts and really has some um, amazing stories about his wartime. Um, he then came back and, um, as we'll hear soon, he uh, as when Dr. Palmer retired, he took over the GI section. Um, he was also then uh, chief of staff here, which was an important time in his career. And then in the later years, um, this is really when I met Dr. Kersner and um, really was inspired and is still a driving force. I always think, what would JBK say or do um, in, on multiple occasions? Um, so I thought that, you know, 
it's, it's good if I talk about him and about his, his life, but it would be much more interesting if we heard from him directly. So this was, oh, and I should say, um, before I go on to that, um, I thought this quote from Jean Chang really um, you know, encapsulates what uh, Dr. Kersner's time at the University, University of Chicago was, and he says, he was here for two lifetimes. I'm not sure where the field would be without him. He was at the beginning of everything, and that's absolutely true. Every story was like, wait, what? You, were, you started there, the NIH, the, you know, so it was amazing. But um, what I thought is we would hear, this is from an interview in the 90s where Dr. Kersner is talking about um, coming to the University of Chicago uh, for the first time and trying to get a job. Well, in any event, I, I came to the University of Chicago Medical Center and applied for a job, and the chairman of the Department of Medicine at the time was a man named George F. Dick, who with his wife Gladys had developed a test for scarlet fever, and he had come from Presbyterian Hospital to be chairman of medicine. And uh, we had a short visit, and he said there wasn't a place open, and uh, I was really unhappy about that, and I... I said, would you mind taking my name and telephone number? Maybe something will happen. And a month later, he, I got a call from George Dick that unexpectedly somebody was leaving and would I be interested? And I said, would I? I'd be happy to come. I didn't even ask what the salary was. <clears throat> and after I accepted, he told me my salary would be $1,000 for the year. <clears throat> Excuse me. So that was my salary. and I worked really, I was assigned to the general medicine clinic, and I worked uh, in the allergy clinic, and uh, uh, I really uh, uh, tried very hard to make a good impression. And at the end of a year, D George Dick called me down to his office. I should tell you that he was about six feet, seven inches tall. He never smiled. He was a rather forbidding presence to a young person like myself. And he said, uh, Kirzner, I've been watching you, and you're doing a good job. And I had visions that maybe I'd get a little raise. But he reached into his pocket and pulled out a fountain pen. And he said, as a token of my appreciation, I'd like you to have this fountain pen. And of course, my heart sank uh, about the, on the matter of a raise, but I was pleased with his, his uh, commendation. So I thanked him and went off and went upstairs and showed the pen to my friends, and they began to laugh, and they said, did you know that Dr. Dick takes care of the Parker family in Janesville, Wisconsin, and he has a whole box of these pens? But nevertheless, I was satisfied, and, and uh, I did get a raise the next year of $200, and uh, so it went. It was a slow going. <clears throat> I still have that pen, by the way. It doesn't write, but I'll, ne I'll never give it up. All right, so those were the, his first job interview here and, and his first uh, review as a faculty member. Um, and so really just to encapsulate um, Dr. Kersner, I think is really to um, remember him as the triple threat that he was. So he was a great educator and was a great mentor to many in the room and many across the country and the world. Um, so here he is uh, performing a gastroscopy uh, with some onlookers. He also um, wrote a book on inflammatory bowel disease, which is in its sixth edition, I believe, so they're all lined up here. Um, and there's a few quotes here from Dr. Hanauer, who said, every gastroenterologist should feel at least slightly indebted to Joe Kersner. And then from Dr. Cohen, Dr. Kersner taught countless young doctors the importance of compassion, respect, and installation of hope in those who came seeking our help. His tireless efforts to relieve human suffering may be his most long-lasting legacy and are multiplied many-fold by those young physicians who have subsequently taught his lessons to their students, who in turn have continued his cause. Um, on the matter of research, he was, as you've heard, um, a, a uh, he was awarded a PhD here in alkalosis, but he continued research, and um, there are great stories about how he started the NIH, and um, really it was because there were mostly physicists and chemists at that time, and they didn't understand anything about patient-oriented um, research. Um, so here he is uh, in the lab. 
Um, and I think in his own words, you know, he said that he, this, the field of gastroenterology when he started was really an art. It was speculative, impressionistic, anecdotal, almost mystical at times. And he really wanted to make it a true hard science, and, and so he did. And then finally, and this is what he would always say, it's about the care of the patient. And he would talk about his Saturday rounds, which I never had an opportunity to participate in, but um, I guess they were legendary and long. Um, but really, this was at the core of everything that, that Dr. Kersner um, did, was about the patients. Um, and Dr. Rubin said he was a bulldog when it came to fighting for his patients, and he transmitted that tenacity to everyone on his team. And then he himself, Dr. Kersner, uh, was quoted in 2003 uh, of saying, the big complaint that patients have is not that we don't know enough, but that we don't care enough. And really, I think this continues and continues. It's almost something uh, every day on rounds that we um, have to remind ourselves of. And so I thought since other um, section chiefs will be talking about their time, I thought we'd end with a quote of Dr. Kersner um, talking about his time as the section chief. So this is another um, clip here. I can get there. There we go. So I mentioned earlier uh, that you really had to do research or else you wouldn't be promoted. And this was a, a very traumatic experience because in 1962, uh, that was the year that Walter Palmer decided to retire at the age of 65. Three members of the GI section were rejected for appointment uh, because they hadn't done research. Wonderful physicians, but they hadn't done research. So as of July 1, <coughs> excuse me, as of July 1, 1962, I was the GI section. And so, uh, in an effort to keep it going and try to recruit people, I worked day and night, weekends, and Minnie was just marvelously supportive. And uh, we, Minnie had a distant relative by the name of Martin Sandler, and we, they had known in Des Moines, Iowa, and in Minneapolis. And, uh, uh, Marty was uh, living in the Chicago area, and he invited us, Minnie and me, to a concert at Ravinia. Uh, we were very much uh, involved with classical music because of Minnie's ballet and my interest in classical music. And on the way, uh, Marty drove, and on the way, I fell asleep. And uh, Marty turned to Minnie and said, uh, how come Joe was asleep? She said, Do you, I wonder if you realize what he's up to, he, uh, what he's involved with. He's the only one in GI, and he's trying to do this and do that and also raise money to try to keep the section going. So Marty uh, was always uh, thinking uh, constructively. Uh, said, gee, uh, maybe we can help him. So uh, when we got to Ravinia, there are a number of people I knew in the audience. And Marty said, gee, we ought to tap these people and talk to these people and see if they'd be interested. Now, I had also taken care of a Joe Valenti senior, a very nice man, and also uh, Joe, the father of Joe Valenti, who was a terrific guy, and uh, took care of his brother. And in gratitude, they gave me a grant of $5,000. And uh, Marty had given a grant of $5,000. And happily, the two of them decided to join forces and form the Gastrointestinal Research Foundation. All right, so that was the origin of the of GERF, which is really amazing how, how to hear about that history. Um, and so I wanted to just conclude again just with Dr. Kersner's words. He wrote this wonderful article, um, Why we, we Still Are More Than Molecules. And I actually was thinking about this as we, I was on the consult service this week, and I thought these words really resonated as we were seeing some incredibly sick patients. But I'll just read um, briefly from this. He basically had, when, this was when he was chief of staff, and he needed to remind uh, some of the physicians and house staff um, that uh, of the need for humanism and for sensitivity in your contacts with patients. They are ill and perhaps overly sensitive. Indeed, as they observe our vast array of physicians, hospital personnel, and machines, and as they brood over their own symptoms and the many for 
formidable diagnostic tests we ask them to undertake, they, are at they, they at times become very apprehensive. If you have not already had this experience, you will find that tactful, informative, and friendly discussion will foster the development of confidence and trust, increase understanding and cooperation, and improve the results of your therapy far beyond technological explanations. Furthermore, you may even achieve the accolade of being a good doctor. And I'd say that Dr. Kersner was more than a good doctor. He was a great doctor and really um, a triple threat and an inspiration that continues today. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. That was terrific. Uh, it's now really my pleasure to invite uh, Irv Rosenberg to the podium who is here with us now uh, from Boston. We're delighted that he was able to make it here today uh, with his wife. Irv, do you want to come up and tell us a little bit about your time here? Thanks. Uh, David, uh, again, thank you uh, so much for uh, conceiving of, of this really uh, heartwarming and wonderful event. Uh, and again to Kathy for so much she did put together. Um, imagine being the third chief of gastroenterology uh, here after uh, Walter Palmer, uh, who, who I think uh, can justifiably be identified as, as uh, certainly one of, if not the person that started the field of gastroenterology as a uh, medical practice in science, and then Joe Kersner. And both of them, uh, as Bob Palmer uh, indicated, uh, had the strongest sense of how important it was to be in communication with the patient. And I think that uh, that quote that we heard about, uh, it's not that uh, we don't know enough, to, uh, the patients, uh, perhaps we don't care enough, but we need to, uh, those giants uh, realized that we needed to communicate that care and that uh, understanding in a way that would help them deal with, uh, with, with whatever illness they had. Transformative leadership. That's what they uh, represented. And um, I must say, uh, it's daunting for me to talk about how to step into that uh, succession uh, at the tender age of 36. Uh, I came here in 1970 to be a part of this, uh, uh, of this uh, growing and dynamic uh, section of gastroenterology, uh, and a year later uh, was asked uh, to become chief. I'd never had any uh, idea or intention that that was what I was coming to the University of Chicago for. But Al Tarloff, who was the chairman of medicine, uh, had a strong sense that it was time uh, for some kind of changing of the guard uh, in the direction of not only strengthening research uh, along with uh, practice and training, but also incorporating uh, a, a, a stronger, uh, encompassing, a stronger part of uh, the new sciences of uh, medicine, biochemistry, immunology, and those kinds of things. And so uh, I think it's fair to say that promoting Joe Kersner to being chief of staff uh, was not only a recognition of the needs of the hospital, uh, but it was also a recognition of a, a mechanism uh, of uh, uh, going to perhaps the next phase of, of uh, the organization of, a, uh, of an academic uh, gastroenterology unit. Uh, I won't, um, I won't uh, go into too much uh, 
detail about uh, those uh, dynamic years uh, uh, starting in the early 70s, except to say that it's interesting that, that the name of this gastroenterology section now is Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition. And that, uh, that enlargement uh, of, the, uh, of the designation of what we were about uh, in gastroenterology, uh, I think, uh, did occur uh, to some considerable extent uh, uh, in the, the next uh, 15 years of which I was uh, um, uh, able to, uh, privileged to be a chief here. And one of the ways we did that was to recognize that even as gastroenterology uh, had been um, thoughtfully considered as either uh, a specialty or a subspecialty uh, of medicine, uh, there was the opportunity to recognize that within gastroenterology, there, would, there were interests and in subunits that, that needed concentration. And how did they need concentration? They needed concentration in an extension of the, of the philosophy with which Billings Hospital was built, which was you, you build offices that, uh, and labs that are in the same corridor uh, as, as the, the patients. That's why we have M for the medicine corridor and P for the pathology corridor and so forth. The notion being if we're going to have full-time practice uh, of academic uh, medicine, and in this case gastroenterology, we needed to have people in, in connection to, to their, their research and their patient care uh, for the purposes of excellence in both and for training. So what we tried to do was to create a series of, of uh, subunits, if you will, uh, of gastroenterology. And in some cases, we had, to, uh, we had to recruit people to be head of those subunits. And those subunits had the charge of, of making a clear connection between what they were doing in the outpatient clinic, the kind of patients they were seeing, the kind of research that they were doing in the laboratory or clinical research, and the kind of patient care that they were involved in. That was not always successful, but imagine that in those years, what developed within the GI section was a, a, a unit, um, I have to remember these things, uh, uh, a unit um, uh, of liver disease for which we recruited uh, Jim Boyer and Al Baker and uh, which also played into some of the interests that Bob Palmer had with his interest in bile salt metabolism and, uh, and cholesterol. We had, uh, we had obviously the unit of inflammatory bowel disease that uh, Kersner represented and then uh, uh, with uh, his association with uh, Sumner Kraft and, and later that, that, that emphasis would uh, become the central interest of Steve Hanauer, who uh, uh, succeeded uh, us as, uh, uh, as, as head of gastroenterology. We, we trained the first uh, pediatric uh, gastroenterologist, uh, and Barbara Kirshner is here, and uh, uh, she, uh, she was the one that carried that, uh, that subspecialty, if you will, uh, to uh, to pediatrics, we, we focused on, on um, GI oncology, and Bernard Levin uh, was uh, the focal point uh, uh, of, uh, of that, and Rob Bresselier was uh, part of that. And uh, 
And then we had two other units that were closer to my, uh, my interest. One was in uh, enteric infection, diarrheal disease, and intestinal transport, brought Mike Field from, uh, from uh, Harvard uh, to uh, head that group, and, and he brought Gene Chang. Uh, and uh, I think it's fair to say, uh, and, then, and then my own uh, colleagues uh, who were interested in the nutritional consequences of GI disease and inflammatory bowel disease, uh, were this, uh, this made a, a major contribution to putting gastroenterology in the leadership of the burgeoning field of clinical nutrition and, and, uh, and nutrition science there. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't also mention uh, what we did with endoscopy. Um, we've already heard about the origins of endoscopy, and uh, like my predecessor, Joe Kersner, uh, I was determined uh, to have other people do endoscopy in the, uh, in the department. And so we, we, we established a separate endoscopy unit uh, that uh, uh, first was uh, contributed to strongly by, by, uh, by Chuck Winans, but, the, but really became the responsibility of, of Mike Blackstone. I should say that virtually every one of the chiefs of that, those units that I just uh, mentioned went on to become uh, heads of their own departments of gastroenterology or hepatology uh, at Yale, at Columbia, at MD Anderson, uh, and uh, at Tufts, uh, and so forth. So I think that idea of, of allowing for that focus of, of the research connected to the outpatient uh, uh, activities in the teaching uh, really made a, a large contribution to the whole field of gastroenterology and medicine uh, and allowed us to uh, make more efficient, I think, uh, our participation in a very, very uh, active uh, 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 challenge uh, to uh, do our work in the presence of 60 inpatient beds, 11 uh, half-day uh, clinics uh, uh, a week, uh, and uh, uh, a very substantial uh, patient population and large group of, of trainees, and I think uh, uh, the record, not so much in my own uh, uh, times, but the record uh, over the years uh, speaks for, uh, for that productivity. I do have to, uh, perhaps partly an introduction of, uh, of Chuck Winans, uh, uh, I do have to say that when I became chief of gastroenterology in 1971, uh, my training in, it had really been in liver disease and nutrition at the Thorndike and at, uh, uh, at Harvard. I had done my research in malabsorption and so forth. I was uh, anything but uh, a uh, well-heeled, uh, trained gastroenterologist. And uh, I think it's fair to say that I knew that. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that I tried to to be distributive in the way in which we organize the GI section. But one of the most important things that I did was recognize that the perhaps the premier uh, clinician uh, after, after Joe Kersner uh, was Chuck Winans. And it wasn't long before uh, I asked Chuck to be uh, the co-chief of gastroenterology. And of course, he made enormously important contributions in that in that capacity. I'll tell you just one uh, anecdote <clears throat> about uh, these uh, 11 sessions in, of outpatient gastroenterology. I mean, the most famous of which was the famous Saturday morning clinic uh, uh, that uh, JBK, uh, I'm, uh, I remind you, uh, he did not stop doing his clinical 
uh, gastroenterology when he became chief of staff. He does not stop doing the, the famous uh, Saturday morning uh, clinic. And I remember uh, that one of the first uh, ones that I went to, um, uh, one of our fellows, I was trying to re remember his name, he became uh, the head of gastroenterology at one of the North Shore hospitals. Uh, but he was, he had seen a patient and as was our uh, technique at the time, Dr. Kersner's technique, um, uh, the, uh, the patient would be uh, interviewed, examined, and then presented to uh, JBK uh, for, you know, discussion. Uh, this uh, trainee uh, presented, uh, asked, asked to present the patient to, to uh, JBK, and JBK uh, kindly said, uh, well, um, why don't you uh, why don't you present this to uh, Irv Rosenberg? And uh, the trainee said, "Oh, but Dr. Kersner, this is a clinical problem. This is not a biochemistry problem." <laughs> <laughs> you can see how, how important I was it was for me to make sure that I had the the skills of someone like. Uh, like Chuck Winans to add to whatever else was going on in the GI section, uh, but I'm I'm really uh, I, you can imagine how proud I am to to uh, have been able to to stand on the on the shoulders of uh, of the giants that you've just heard about, uh, and I think uh, in our own way uh, over those next years. We made, we made some important and even perhaps transformative uh, contributions to the field. Thank you. Thirty-six years old, huh? That's amazing. Thank you. Uh, it's, not my <laughs> it's not my pleasure to invite up uh, Chuck Winans. Uh, it was Dr. Winans who taught me many things when I was a fellow, including how to perform an endoscopy properly and how to document it, which I still do to this day and try to transmit to other fellows, but also the, really the importance of uh, a variety of things in the way you take a history and document it properly, including the patient narrative, which he was a master of. So we're really delighted to welcome Dr. Winans back and to hear a little bit about him. First of all, I, I just wanted to say that I've enjoyed every speaker's uh, talk. I've learned a lot about the section of gastroenterology, a few things I've heard before, but uh, for the most part I've, I've learned some things and I've enjoyed it a great deal. And uh, David, I, I think this is a wonderful idea. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, because I think we're running a little behind time. Uh, so, so let me say that I was surprised that I got accepted here because I was a clinician, uh, not a researcher, but a clinician. And uh, I, uh, I, I thought, I, I asked my chairman uh, of, guess, of uh, medicine uh, for advice as to where I should apply, and he had told me Isselbacher and Inglefinger and Kersner. And, and, he, and he was the section chief of this hospital, actually. And uh, he, uh, but he, he qualified this. He said, uh, you should go to Boston, <laughs> and you should not go to Cleveland, uh, go to Chicago. So I, uh, because it's too clinical. Too, Joe is too clinical. And I foolishly accepted that <laughs> uh, and uh, w went to Boston. And, and, but uh, it, it all culminated in, at Atlantic City when I had breakfast with Kersner and Inglefinger together. And uh, as a result of that, I came here uh, be because uh, they uh, invited me and gave me a job, and I, I was very, and very grateful to them for doing that. Uh, 
what did I do as a clinician in this place? Well, Irv did everything, really. I didn't have much to do. What Irv didn't do, Cursor did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, so I didn't have a lot to do. Uh, but I, I, uh, I was grateful for the opportunity to be, to be in a leadership position, and uh, I uh, uh, was grateful for the opportunity to teach the fellows and, and to spend some time directing the clinical activities. I, uh, uh, the hardest part of the job, I think, was telling people to accept that that position at another institution that they were offered when, when, they, when their uh, research w uh, in, entitled them to that position. And I, uh, I resented, uh, I, I hated doing that, but I did it. Uh, I uh, also was happy to uh, encourage the uh, subspecialization of gastroenterology. Uh, as when I began, everybody in gastroenterology did everything. Uh, when I finished, we were completely subspecialized in, in, into the area, and, and, and I thought that was a good, a good idea. And uh, those, those I, uh, things I supported very strongly. Uh, I, uh, I enjoyed uh, my time here. Uh, it was only five years. That's hard to believe. Uh, it seemed like a lot longer to me <laughs> than that. <laughs> but uh, it, it was a wonderful time. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, being here, and I've enjoyed uh, uh, the talks of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, and I, I do want to acknowledge that you're here, of course, with your wife and your son and his family, and we welcome them all to join us here. Uh, Tom Brasitis sends his regrets, but uh, sends good wishes, and we've invited, is Mark Bissonette here? Did he make it over yet? Okay, so otherwise we have uh, another one of his trainees and somebody who was very happy to speak about uh, Tom. And actually, Jean Chang prepared some of the remarks, and we're going to invite Russell Cohen to the podium to speak about Dr. Brasitis. Um, Russ is currently the director of our Inflammatory Bowel Disease Center and one of our professors, and uh, worked with Tom and always has some good stories to tell and wanted to share a little bit about uh, Dr. Brasitis. Thank you. Well, thank you, guys. It's a, re it's a real honor um, uh, to be called up here. Uh, I might have good stories to tell, but he always had better stories. You know, um, so Gene Chang uh, is uh, the person who we had, had wanted to come up here, and uh, he had to decline, unfortunately. But he did um, provide me with some of what he wanted to say. I'm going to uh, say that first uh, because I think it's really quite special. Um, uh, so it's, for Gene, uh, it's an absolute pleasure to say a few words about my friend and colleague Tom Bersitis. Uh, Section Chief Tom was an extraordinary individual a mentor, an administrator, and an outstanding physician scientist who accomplished so much during his tenure at the University of Chicago. Under his leadership, the GI section achieved excellence in patient care, national and international academic standing training, and scientific eminence. His legacy includes the numbers of academic leaders he trained and early stage investigators that he successfully promoted. Uh, and now this is, again, Gene's voice. Uh, among them are individuals like myself, so Gene Chang, uh, Nick Davidson, who uh, went to Washington University, Bernie Davis, uh, Prajeep uh, Dujera, UIC, Terry Barrett, who we know was at Northwestern for years and now in Kentucky, Mark Bissonette uh, here, Avril Ma, who was here and then to UCSF, Judy Cho, uh, who went to Yale and then Mount Sinai, and Steve Hanauer. And then he says, apologies to people I left out but the, these are the names on the top of my head. I only have so much time to speak. So Tom was relentless in ensuring that all of us were given resources and opportunity, and he was the strongest advocate for everyone in the GI section to achieve at the highest level. Tom had an uncanny ability to get things done, and largely through his efforts and sheer will, we successfully complete, competed for one of the prestigious NIDDK P30 Digestive Disease Research Core Centers, DDRCC, which continues today 
and is the cornerstone of basic and translational research in the GI section. Tom has the, had the golden touch in writing grants, <laughs> as you all know, and getting NIH and non-federal funds. I think one time he uh, said to me, I'm actually paying for no one's salary in this section. <laughs> Uh, that's my words. Uh, and at the same time, he ran a tight ship with clinical operations. And finally, uh, it bears to mention that Tom was elected as the president of the American Gastroenterological Association during his tenure at the University of Chicago. He was clearly one of the major thought leaders of this time who had a huge impact on training, education, and research in gastroenterology. And um, just I wanted to add, uh, I'd like to echo uh, Gene's sentiments. Tab, as we uh, all affectionately known him, uh, was relentless really was relentless in pushing us to the next level. He was fiercely protective of the fellows and the junior faculty, who, and always reassure us that he was on our side. He would, as he tapped his pipe, he'd always say, I'm on, I'm on your side, I'm on your side. I, I can't repeat some of the other words that he said in this mixed audience, but whenever a potential adversary crossed our path, he made it clear that that person was a bleepy and that he was on our side. Uh, just as a, fun, a funny story, as a junior faculty, maybe a couple of years out, I went into his office uh, once I said, you know, said I'm becoming an emerging person in inflammatory bowel disease and I, I need a title. And he said, a title? He said, titles cost me nothing. You can have whatever title you want. <laughs> <laughs> and that, I think, pretty sums up uh, Tom. He actually helped so many people launch their academic careers and is really his legacy continues on in all of us who grew to know him and love him. And um, I, I think I speak for all of us, our most sincere help for a uh, return to his good health for our friend and our mentor. Thank you. Thanks, Russ. And, and now uh, it's my pleasure to invite up Steve Hanauer, who is my mentor and good friend and someone who, as chief here, grew the section, of course, and we'll hear a little bit about that, but is uh, certainly world-renowned for his expertise in inflammatory bowel disease um, and also truly uh, a master clinician. It's always been something that I've treasured most from learning from Steve. So Steve, thanks for making the long trip over here from Northwestern and being with us today. Thank you. I couldn't understand why Kathy gave me 45 minutes to speak today, but I'm sure I can use it. She meant four or five. Oh, that's what, we'll get there. So what have we heard? I think we've heard mentorship, we've heard family, we've heard scientists, we've heard clinicians and clinician scientists. Um, I was able to take over the section after Tom Bersitis resigned. Um, I met a family of administration. I'm so delighted Betsy Hunt is here and Kathy Pantazis, who have been uh, part of the division, part of the section, and Kathy's still here. And I understand there's a lot of cycling back of several of our uh, prior administration. Mark Mitchell, uh, who served with me um, before I left. Um, this has been a phenomenal family and including our Gurf family. Um, certainly, although I've been away for a number of years, I was part of the Gurf family for a great uh, amount of time. My wife, Jane, obviously was also uh, very active in the organization. And uh, this section really has represented all of those different aspects. I was originally not particularly interested in gastroenterology. Uh, my colleagues and mentees proteges know that I was originally interested in infectious disease um, and actually had a fellowship planned and a chief residency planned uh, starting with an infectious disease fellowship. Um, my last rotation as a resident was on the GI service. It was actually my second rotation uh, with Dr. Kersner and uh, we became uh, very close. Um, there's a lot of psyche behind that. Um, I had lost, I was actually partially raised by my grandfather. He was much older than me at the time, much older than my father would have been. And uh, his son was not uh, necessarily, um, they had some issues as well. 
So I pretty much became, he was a father figure and I'm sure I was a son figure uh, to him. During those two months of rotation, actually it was November and December, uh, Kersner was on in November and Irv was supposed to be on in December uh, with us uh, to be my uh, attending, but Joe didn't trust him. Uh, so he stayed on another month. <laughs> Uh, after those two months, and I was already committed to start an infectious disease, uh, actually in January, um, as I say it, I saw the light, and it was behind a proctoscope. Um, and I went to Irv and to Chuck, who were the division section chiefs at the time, told them that I had a vision, and um, of course with the support of Dr. Kersner, and uh, then I went to the head of the uh, infectious disease program, Pierce Gardner at the time, who was also very uh, important in mentorship and said, Steve, our job is to facilitate your career, not to direct it. And gave me permission to switch and uh, the GI group was able to embrace me and uh, that was the beginning. Scientist, Irv was an incredible, is an incredible scientist. Um, my experience with him, was of course both on the wards and uh, during fellowship. We wrote a number of papers with Jose Bengo at the time who was working in nutrition. Um, and what I remember from Irv is that we would write an abstract and it would go through about 30 revisions, back and forth and back and forth and back and forth to Irv and myself or the others. And finally, when it was in its original form, we sent it out. <laughs> Chuck Winans truly has been the best clinician I'd ever met. You could say Kersner was the best doctor. Chuck was the best clinician. History was everything. Uh, he was incredibly precise with the patients. He was, as David said, a precise descriptor of illness. And I, I think actually I've come up with a saying, which is the electronic medical record has taken the narrative out of illness. Chuck wrote the narrative of illness for patients, and uh, that was very important and a very important aspect to uh, myself and all of the uh, subsequent trainees. Tom was a phenomenal scientist as well. He was a phenomenal administrator. He was one of the few people who could stand up to the department chairman at any time. Uh, he always complained about the Department of Medicine, right, Betsy? Uh, but he was uh, very facile at, at being able to develop the uh, section and bring it forward. Mentorship and family. Well, the rest of my family are the family here. And uh, between Gene Chang, who was a partner for 35 years and who I truly miss being away from him, as well as my protégés, Russ Cohn, Dave Rubin, Atsushi, Sakuraba in the back, Many that I'm, Sonia, of course, not directly under me, but uh, clearly wonderful. And this faculty has really been a uh, phenomenal uh, group of people. You can see the diversity, how it's uh, enlarged and strengthened, continues to grow. And um, it wasn't uh, spontaneous uh, when I left. I knew that David was going to be the next section chief. Uh, we knew he was going to be section chief when he was a medical resident, frankly. <laughs> Kersner had his eye on him. From that point on, I think he, uh, he represented everything we expected of him. We know that he's going to go and continue to uh, build the section here and do uh, great things. Um, when I was his boss, uh, it took David David is always a phenomenal clinician. Everybody knew that. He was always a phenomenal educator. Everyone knew that. Um, but he wasn't a great writer. And it took a long time for his writer's block to actually end. And so when we brought him up for promotion, and it was still early, but earlier than most, um, the one criticism that I had from all of the other departments was, Steve, what took you so long to promote him? And it was just basically the waters had to break and he had to get his publications out. And with that, it was the easiest promotion I think uh, the department's ever had. 
So um, David's going to take you on for the immediate future, which is, of course, uh, phenomenal. This is a great, uh, oh, Jerry Rogers, who's one of my other mentors, by the way. Jerry taught me endoscopy, and uh, I'm so delighted to see that he's still, uh, still here today. So uh, David and the followers are going to continue with this uh, great history and the great reputation. And I just want to say that I have full confidence. Uh, this is a phenomenal institution, a phenomenal department, a phenomenal section of gastroenterology. And uh, I just wish you all the best for the future. Thank you. Well, with that, I actually want to acknowledge the artist um, who painted our portraits. He's here with us today. Do you want to raise your hand up so we can all say hello? Um, Michael Van Ziel. We actually know his work because he had done a lovely portrait of Dr. Kersner when he turned 100, uh, and we've always admired that, so it was a no-brainer who we would want to uh, participate in this new project. And we're uh, very happy you're here with us, Michael, so thank you for being here and for your very hard work working with all of our former chiefs. Um, so with that, I know you've all been waiting for it. Kathy's going to turn on the newly installed light. You have to pull the pin out from the top. There we go. So take your time to come enjoy. And obviously, there'll be some photos. I would like to ask the former chiefs who are here to come up front for a picture uh, as a group. And then for those who are interested, we have a couple of uh, faculty and fellows who are going to lead a, a small tour if you want to see the facility currently. Uh, so let's start with the photo up here after you guys get a chance to take a look at your likenesses. And I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank everyone for their support. I especially want to thank uh, Kathy Pentazis for all of her hard work putting this together. Thank you. Yeah.